I was almost giddy when the priest agreed to perform the exorcism. Father Maxey is actually fairly well known in the area. He had completed several rather public exorcisms, one of them on a councilman's daughter that had changed the girl so drastically that others had trouble disagreeing with his abilities. While some people believed he was just a well-meaning shyster, many people believed he was the real deal. He seemed to be just what I needed in my current situation. Sitting in his office at St. Marco's, it seemed oddly humble for a man like him. There was no extravagance in his office, only the humble set pieces of a public servant. The wall behind him held a picture of the softball team that he coached, of happy parishioners at a picnic, and smiling children at the hospital where he had gone to speak. He sat behind a very normal desk that you could have probably found at any Ikea, and his chair squeaked a little, letting me know that it had likely served him for quite some time. Sitting across from him, though, I could tell that he was anything but average. He seemed to exude power as he sat smiling at me, and I was confident that he was the right man for the job. One of my parishioners said that you had reached out. What can I do for you today, my child? I tried to find the best way to start, and finally decided to be honest with him. There's an entity in my house, one who has become darker and darker the longer he stays. He's entrenched himself, and I don't know how to get him out. The priest nodded, pulling out a notepad and taking a pencil from the holder. Go on. It was nothing at first. Small offerings, things that didn't need to be in my house anyway. But he started hurting my cats, and now both of them are gone. It's not uncommon for entities like this to target small things that can't defend themselves. Has this entity taken up inside someone you love? A child, or a wife, perhaps? Actually, it's taken up in one of my cats. The priest looked at me as if trying to see if he had misheard me. I'm sorry, did, did you say a cat? I nodded, certain now that he would laugh and tell me that I was overreacting. He would tell me to stop wasting his time and send me on my way. Then I'd have to go home to my apartment and look at that large orange feline and see the realization there. He would know what I had done, know where I had been, and I would likely suffer for it. To my surprise, the priest told me to tell him more and I sighed in relief, glad to have someone who believed me. I had been living with Calvin for a year now, but the problem hadn't started until a few months ago. He was such a delight at first, he and his brothers filling my home with joy, but that was before he had begun to bring me gifts. Calvin loved the extra attention, loved the treats I gave him because of those gifts, and so he kept finding them, despite my confusion as to where they were coming from. I didn't mind, not much. Calvin was a good boy, and he was making the house safer by catching and bringing me his gifts. His brothers didn't understand. They were jealous of what he was getting, and that's likely what led to our current state of affairs. His brother had taken one of his gifts, and now he was gone. Very soon they were both gone, and Calvin's gifts became darker. Now he was bringing me things that... um going to have to start having trouble explaining, and so I figured it was time to enlist the help of a professional. As I finished, the priest furrowed his brow and circled something on the notepad. Are you sure it's the cat? he asked. He didn't seem skeptical. He sounded more like he wanted to be sure before he made plans. I am, I told him. What makes you so sure? It could very well be someone breaking in and leaving these things. It could be something else entirely, something that you're not seeing. I shook my head. It's definitely him, Father. The way he looks at me, the way he acts, it's all so different than it was before the rats. I don't know what it is. I don't know where it came from. But he's not the same cat that I took in a year ago. The anger and the heat in his eyes isn't something I've ever seen in a cat before. It's almost human, and its intensity, I, I don't know how much longer it'll be content to let me wander around in its space. Father Maxey nodded, putting the notebook into his pocket as he reached under the desk for a leather bag that 
looked like a toiletry holder more than anything. Very well, let's go. I was speechless. Just, just like that? <laughs> My son, I've been in this business for a long time. I've learned to read people, and I can see that whatever this presence is, demonic or not, you are terrified of it. If my presence will help alleviate that terror, then I owe it to you, and to God, to go and have a look. Believe it or not, my calendar isn't as full as some people might think. I have to be back for evening mass in a few hours, but until then, I can go and help you with your problem. He begged my patience for a few minutes, as he took out the stole of his office and checked the bag to make sure he had the things he would need. He took a tin from his desk, and I saw that it was full of the host, the wafers they use for communion. He took an old worn Bible from his desk and placed it under one arm as he told me to lead the way. He rode with me to my apartment, and the second we came to the front, I knew something was off. The sky over St. Marco's had been blue and clear, but the sky over my apartment was full of angry clouds, and the wind that whipped the father's robes felt like a hurricane. The people inside looked out the window and marked us, more than a few of them crossing themselves as we walked inside. I think they had felt a darkness gathering around the apartment as well, and they hoped that Father Maxie might be able to dispel whatever had been haunting them. There were police cars in front of the main office, and I could see the officers inside talking to the building supervisor. I tensed as we walked past them, not sure what fresh hell had happened while I was away. Gavin, said the building super, these men are here about the disappearance of the girl in E-12. You haven't seen her recently, have you? He seemed almost hopeful, and why shouldn't he be? His own child, his newborn baby, had gone missing less than a month ago. It had put a pall over the whole building, and sometimes you could hear him roving up and down the halls, calling for her at night. The bottle in his hand led us all to believe that the drink had driven him to it. He hoped that maybe if they found this girl the nine-year-old who had so often skipped down the stairs on her way to school, that they would find his baby as well. They would all be safe and sound together, and the girl's family wouldn't be the only one to have a happy reunion that day. I personally doubted they would ever find a trace of either of them, unless the offering I had flushed had made its way into the sewer somehow. I told him I didn't know, but I got the feeling that the priest didn't quite believe me. The police said that if I discovered any information, to let them know immediately, and I said that I would. One of them, an older cop with a salt and pepper mustache, didn't seem like he believed me either. But he let me leave, and as we went upstairs, the old priest asked me about it. You suspect that the missing girl is connected with your problem, don't you? I didn't look at him, but I nodded. I've found things in the apartment the last few weeks hair barrettes and small toys, a kid's shoe under the couch, and... but I couldn't bring myself to tell him about the little foot. And yet, you came to me, instead of the police. I almost laughed. Father, I barely thought you would believe me. Imagine what kind of luck I would have, going to the cops and telling them that the missing children they've been searching for are being taken by a 20-pound house cat. He accepted my answer, but I started to wonder if I should have told anyone about it. I've been getting rid of things, I find, putting them at the bottom of my garbage and praying that no one would find them. I knew what it would mean if they did. They might not believe that a cat had done it, but they would certainly believe that I had done it. They would find no evidence of my involvement, nothing besides Calvin's grizzly trophies, but that would be enough. I'd be spending my time on death row after that, and Calvin would be free to roam again. We came out of the stairwell, and it almost seemed like the lights on my floor were dimmer. The budget for lights had likely never been very large, but a strange haze seemed to cover everything, and it made the whole floor look darker. I saw the father take something out of his pocket, and I was not surprised to see it was a crucifix. He had noticed it too and he wasn't about to walk blindly into the den of evil. When we came to the door of my apartment, he put a hand on my shoulder as I slid the key in. Open the door, but let me go in first. Are you sure that's wise? I don't want whatever this is to have a chance to take you and make my job harder. 
Let me go in first and follow behind me. I will do what must be done, and one way or another, your problems will be at an end. I didn't much care for the implications, but I suppose there was no other way. I turned the lock and opened the door. The darkness in the hallway had been nothing compared to the darkness in my apartment. It was the middle of the day. Even with the clouds outside, there should have been some ambient light. Instead, the inside of the apartment was as black as midnight. It almost felt like a blackout, but only for my particular unit. I reached in to try to flip the switch, but the priest pushed my hand away and stepped into the doorway. His crucifix sprung to life, the brightness that of a spotlight with a huge lumen count. Inside the apartment, I could see Calvin sitting on the back of the couch and looking questioningly at us. He had his head cocked to the side, as if to ask what we were doing, and it was such a normal gesture from a cat that I almost doubted what I had felt. Had I been wrong? Had I misread the situation? Now I had drugged this priest from his duties and wasted his time. I started to apologize to the old man, but one look at his face told me that he did not share my opinion. As he began to chant in low but solid Latin, Calvin went crazy. He fell off the back of the couch, beginning to roll on the hardwood, and as the priest advanced on him, he didn't let up at all. Calvin was writhing in pain, his eyes wide as if to ask what was happening. The priest took something out of the bag with his free hand, his eyes never leaving the cat. When he spritzed him with the holy water, Calvin rolled and leaped at him. It was so quick that I didn't think the priest had been expecting it, and when the scratch appeared on his cheek, he dropped the bottle and reeled back in pain. He never dropped the crucifix, though, the glowing talisman seeming to be a part of his body. Calvin scampered off into the house, and I could swear that the fur he left behind was singed. There was a smell in the air like burning hair, and as I made to go after him, the priest put an arm out to stop me. Stay with me. He's a wily old soul. He'll have you if he's able, now that his latest form is compromised. He, he really is a demon then? I asked, not sure if I had ever really believed it. I was behind the priest as we tracked towards the kitchen, but I could still see his nod in the gloom. There are many such demons who hide in animals, because they know it's not what humans expect. This allows them to work great evil, knowing that their unwitting owners will not believe that their favorite pet is capable of such things. As we came into the kitchen, I could see the light from the fridge as it suddenly spilled across the floor. The intrusion into the blackness made me nervous, but the priest seemed to expect it. He lifted some of the host from the tin, holding it like he meant to throw it. The harsh light was the only illumination in the space, but I instinctively looked up as we came in, catching the eyes just before he leapt. Calvin had always had a thing for being up high, and not a day went by that I didn't have to shoo him off the top of the cabinets. For an old guy, the priest was amazingly agile. He spun before I could even warn him, pressing the host to Calvin's face as he came screeching down on us. As it disintegrated, he grabbed him by the throat and bore him to the ground, pressing the crucifix to his brow as the cat clawed at him. I could see the priest's arm growing red as the skin was torn, but he held him against the linoleum, chanting Latin at the flailing beast. The cross glowed brightly, the harsh fluorescence sending steam up from the fluffy tom, and when his hand suddenly released, there was nothing left but some flying bits of fur and the harsh jingle of his collar as it fell to the ground. The priest sucked in a breath of pain, but smiled as he shook the remaining ginger strands from his fingers. I'm sorry, it appeared that the demon wasn't inside your cat. I looked at him strangely, not quite getting it. The demon was your cat. I don't know why it took him so long to manifest, or even what brought it on, but your furry friend was of hell. I have sent him back, but if you notice anything strange in the future, don't hesitate to call me. He took his leave then, refusing any form of payment, and I'm happy to say that most of the oddities around the apartment have ceased. The girl from floor E was 
the last one to go missing, and some of that gloom that hung around the apartment has faded. No sign of the children was ever found, but I pray that their parents find some solace as time goes on. I got a dog to replace Calvin, a German shepherd that was looking for a good home, and he seems pretty happy to be my new friend. He does bark at nothing from time to time, especially in the kitchen, but I'm sure that's just a normal thing for dogs to do. I miss Calvin sometimes, and I still mourn him and his brothers and the lives that were lost to this hell kitty, but I'm sure that he's where he belongs now. My brother and I work for a cleaning company in our hometown. We're both still in high school. He's a junior and I'm a senior. So it was either this or fast food. The owner is a friend of Dad's. We'll call him Chuck to protect the innocent. Chuck's a nice enough guy. My brother and I have known him since we were young. But he leaves a lot to be desired as a businessman. Don't misunderstand. The guy makes money. But he seems to think that employee safety comes after profit. My brother and I worked like dogs for him all summer, cleaning out people's yards and moving boxes out of abandoned houses. Anything to make a buck, I guess. It was nearly July when Chuck got a call from another of his old friends, Philip O'Dare. If Chuck is a little underhanded in his business practices, then Philip is a goddamn pirate. He's the town's number one real estate agent, and I mean everything when I say that he sells everything. He owns a pawn shop, Broke Brokers, with his younger brother. When he wasn't out selling houses, he was looking for homes to buy. The homes he picks up are rough, most of the time. If he were selling them a fixer-upper, that would be okay. The problem is that after he picks up these houses for next to nothing, he does shoddy band-aid repairs on them. Then he sells them for top prices usually to pick them back up a few years later when the occupants move out in disgust. My current situation is thanks in part to Philip's underhanded renovations and Chuck's less than stellar business sense. The Foskey place, I asked? I didn't even know Mr. Foskey was dead. Chuck looked up from his notepad, his gray hair making him look like a cloud with glasses. He's not. Foskey's son sent him to Golden View and sold his house to Odair Real Estate. That made me a little sad. Mr. Foskey had been my English teacher when I was in middle school, and he had also taught Dad when he was in eighth grade. My brother had not been what you would call an advanced English-compatible student, so he didn't get him. But Dad and I both agreed that Mr. Foskey was the best. He always had such cool lesson plans and exciting books in his class library. He challenged his advanced students to be more than a title and wanted us to be more than just A-plus students. I was sad to hear that he had been fired a couple of years ago. He had started to get a little senile in his old age. Everyone said so. And his taste in books had always been a little esoteric. After he'd been fired, he'd become a hermit. He only came out at night, and the word around town was that he'd been going through people's garbage. What he saw it was anyone's guess. But... People came to visit him and said his house was full of junk. Now he was gone, off to the mental hospital in the next town, and we were left to clean up his house. Phil says to save anything that looks valuable. Apparently the guy had a ton of old books that were probably worth the money. Fosky's son sold Phil the house and everything in it, so don't bother saving anything sentimental. A couple of weeks in the puzzle factory and the old man probably won't even remember his own name. I left before I could say anything stupid. The thought of a brilliant man like Mr. Foskey losing his mind in a place like Golden View made me sick at the time. Now, I think it might be exactly what he deserves. We arrived at 6 a.m. Philip was waiting for us, a cell phone against his ear and a latte in his other hand. He was dressed in his usual blue suit, and I imagine we looked pretty shabby next to him in our jeans and black t-shirts with the company name on them. My brother had rolled the sleeves up on his, his motorcycle boots peeking out from beneath the cuffs of his new jeans. He was going through some kind of James Dean phase, but it really just made him look like an extra in Greece. We waited for Philip to finish, and when he did, he looked at us like we were in the way. Well, what are you waiting for? A breakdown on what exactly we're doing, I said a little hotly. <laughs> Thought you boys were smart. Clean the damn house and save what can be sold. Old bastard bought the house five years ago after his kids moved out. 
It's a one bedroom, one bath, and I have a client who wants to see it Wednesday. So if you could not take all week about it, that would be great. Well, take a look and let you know by the end of the day, okay? He scoffed again, clearly saving all that charm for his clients. Just have it done. I'll pay you double if you can finish it by Wednesday. You, not your boss. That was a tempting offer. Chuck was great, but he tended to be a little tight with the checks. We were being paid under the table, so we couldn't really argue. But some extra cash would be sweet. I shook Philip's hand, and he said to have it done by Wednesday. He nodded and left, the sound of his T-bird cutting up the road as he went. I immediately regretted my words when I saw inside the house. The house had a strange floor plan. There was a living room, a dining room with a bar that overlooked from the kitchen. Off the kitchen was a bathroom, and a door to get out back where you could sit in a small backyard. Off the living room was another door that I guessed was to the bedroom. The house had a strange sort of feel to it when you came inside, and I could believe that such a place would draw Mr. Foskey to it. It was eccentric in a practical way, a way that he would have understood. The living room dining room was full of trash and furniture, stuff floor to ceiling, and I could see a little walkway from the living room to the kitchen. The kitchen was spared the worst of it, but it was still covered in garbage. The floor was a solid foot of garbage. The cabinets were covered in old food wrappers, and the refrigerator seemed clean, though it wouldn't open due to the junk on the floor. The cabinets were stuffed with garbage, and I sighed as I thought about the job at hand. This looked like a good week's worth of work between the living room and the kitchen I won't. I'll take the kitchen, you take the living room. Whoever finishes first will help the other. <laughs> Why do you get the kitchen? Rolled my eyes at him. See a lot of furniture in there, football star. He got Dad's build. So you do the heavy lifting. Guess that means you got mom's bill. So I guess you can get your bitch ass in the kitchen, he said with a laugh. We put on our respirators, rubber boots, and thick gloves. We hadn't seen anything that would make us break up the hazmat suits yet, but I like to be safe. We were definitely working with some old refuse, possibly refuse that had been outside, which meant that rodents were a danger, as well as insects. We were cleaning out a shed like this not even a month ago, and ran upon a secret hornet's nest. That had made us wary about attacking big mounds of trash, so I was careful to look where I was putting my hands as I started in the kitchen. I got lucky. The trash was mostly dry and clean, and it was easily bagged up. I heard my brother straining and grunting in the living room, and I looked out to see him wrestling with a sizable piece of furniture. He was dragging it out onto the lawn. Philip had a mobile storage unit pointing out the front, and then loading them into the unit. I watched him groan as he tried to lift an antique dining room table which had been the linchpin on a large pile of garbage before going to help him. The pile fell over as we freed the table, and I helped him lug it out onto the yard. This is how we spent our first day, at least till mid-afternoon. By four, I had all the garbage out of the kitchen. My brother had gotten most of the furniture out of the living room, and was wiping sweat off his brow as he stuffed papers into a bag. <laughs> Doesn't this guy have AC? I haven't seen a thermostat. Maybe it's in the bedroom. My brother stood up and walked to the door coming off the living room. As he opened it, I heard him whistle and came to see what he had found. Inside the bedroom was a tunnel of solid junk. It snaked to the left, getting dim inside, and the tunnel looked as though someone had cut it out of solid junk. You sure you want to go in there? I asked. He just rolled his eyes and took a pen light out of his pocket. This shouldn't take long, he said as he tromped into the room. I stood for a few seconds, making sure the whole pile wouldn't just fall over. I went back to work in the kitchen. I should have gone with him, maybe been a little more attentive, but I was in a hurry and really wanted to have a look at the bathroom before quitting time. I got all the garbage bags out of the cabinets, stuffed six bags with nothing to trash. I unearthed the sink and the microwave and then started cleaning the countertops when I noticed something wasn't right. The trash was still in the same place my brother had left it, and the door to the bedroom still hung open. Was he still in there? There was no way it had taken him an hour to navigate the bedroom and find the thermostat. I called his name into the bedroom. The name almost seemed to echo down the trash hall, but there was no answer. It was starting to get close to sunset, and I really wanted to be out of here before dark. Thinking maybe he had fallen or gotten hurt in there, I grabbed a headlamp and headed into the trash maze. I turned the corner and was bombarded by the claustrophobia of the trash tunnel. The tunnel was a solid mass of trash that seemed almost sculpted, it was like someone had built a wall out of mortar and trash and then cut a tunnel out of it. There was a soft light coming from the garbage wall, and when I turned off my headlamp, I found I could see. The dim light seemed to be coming from something inside the wall, 
but even with the headlamp on, I couldn't tell what it was. It made navigating the strange, winding maze a little easier, but the size started to unsettle me as I moved. The bedroom was supposedly twelve by twelve, but this maze seemed to be winding on farther than the whole house. I'd been taking turns for several minutes when I came upon the first strange sight. Coming around a bend, I came face to face with a small library. A small grotto held four bookcases, stuffed with old-looking books. Many of them were covered in mold, and as I got close, I could see bugs moving across them. I backed away and kept walking, not sure how deep this rabbit hole went, but wanting to be out more and more with every step. I kept looking down periodically, seeing if I could see a print from my brother's big rubber boots in the dust. I was looking for any sign that he had passed this way, but I was coming up with nothing so far. Then... I came upon the old man. I turned a corner and found myself in a ten-by-ten ten park with honest-to-God grass. There was a lamp post that spilled light over the old park bench, and an old man sat on it, feeding real pigeons. As I approached, he patted the bench as though he wanted me to sit. One look at the old man told me that I did not want to sit there. He was dressed in a long coat that looked patched and frayed, a fuzzy old cap obscuring his face. He patted the seat again as I approached, but... I had already decided that I would not be stopping. The whole situation was a little creepy, and I intended to just walk on and continue on my way. When his hand shot out and grabbed me, I nearly jumped a foot. His hand was covered in thick green mold, and when he looked up, I could see the same mold growing on his face. He grinned his gap-toothed smile at me, and for a moment, I thought it was Mr. Foskey. His grip was firm, but moist, and when I pulled away, his hand slipped off and he sat there, grinning at me. Something clamped down on my ankle then, and I looked down to see that he was feeding rats. These were wharf rats too, no cute pet shop mice, and as they tried to scuttle up my rubber boot, I kicked out at them and turned to run. The old man was standing then, a creaky moan coming from his dusty throat, but I was out of the park and into the tunnel again. I ran, flat out. And as I ran, I imagined I could see lights in the wall reaching out for me. Their brightness came reaching out towards me, and I ducked away from them as I came. The tunnel seemed to be nightmarishly claustrophobic as I ran, and I began taking turns at random. I had no idea where I was or where I was going. I only knew that I wanted to be out. I prayed that this tunnel would end, and I would just flop out on the carpet of the dirty living room, that my brother would be waiting there for me. He would wonder where I had been and what it take me so long. If we would leave, never come back to this place. Screw O'Dare. Screw his money, too. As I stopped panting, clutching the stitch in my side, I just wanted to be out. That's when I heard the footsteps. They echoed strangely up the tunnel. They filled me with a deep sense of dread. Was it... was it the old man coming after me? Some new war? I didn't know. The steps were heavy ominous, and I knew that I did not want them to find me. I hid around the corner in a little trash alcove and shuddered in my cowardice. The steps grew closer. I was shaking all over. The footsteps were slow and knowing. I just knew it was some kind of new monster that wanted me. It was some old monster that was trying to invade me like it had invaded the old man. It was the old man who wanted to breathe spores into me and infect me. I didn't know what it was, and I didn't care. At that moment, I just wanted to leave, and I was willing to kill to get out of here. Clump, clump, clump. I saw a rock on the ground. Clump, clump, clump. It looked jagged, broken like a paving stone. Clump, clump, clump. I picked it up and held it against my chest. Clump, clump, clump. I closed my eyes and steeled myself for what I was about to do. Clump, 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 clump. I rounded the corner and swung the stone, and it connected with something that immediately staggered back, bellowing. I swung it again, but it hit me around the waist and drove me to the ground. I dropped the rock in the skirmish, and as it rolled away, I felt hands close around my throat. It was choking me, choking the life out of me, and as I groped around, I could see little black swirls at the corners of my vision. I swung my fist out at it, but without oxygen, it was a weak swing at best. I went back to groping, trying to find something. And finally, my hands settled on something hard and jagged. I grabbed the rock and swung it, filling my lungs with air as the hands loosened and the shape fell away. I lifted the rock and swung it down at the shape, hitting it in the head. 
I straddled it, swinging it again and again and again, until it finally stopped moving. I was panting then, out of breath, covered in sweat, but I felt my breath escape in a sudden whoosh when I flipped on the headlamp. I was choking again. I could not find any air. I was straddling a human being, his face mostly caved in, but the rolled up shirt sleeves were a dead giveaway. He was wearing our shirt, the shirt with the two happy moving men on the front, and as I threw the rock away, the tears began to flow. I jumped off him and ran, leaving him in the tunnel to God only knows what. I ran in a blind panic. I ran until I couldn't run anymore, and I just kept running. I ran until my legs burned and my lungs heaved. I bumped into the walls and saw them crumble around me. As they fell, I felt the trap envelop me. I embraced the entombing refuse as my fate. I had killed my brother. I deserved to be encased in garbage for all eternity. I deserved it. I deserved it. I... I... I could see flashing lights and was aware of being carried. I opened my eyes to see two paramedics rolling me into an ambulance. Chuck was following behind them, clearly panicked. Philip was there too, but he looked more aggravated than worried. As we drove away in the ambulance, I looked around. They seemed to become aware that I wasn't unconscious. What... what happened? I asked, and the two of them filled me in. Philip had come out after dark to check on our progress. After finding the house mostly still cluttered, he had called Chuck and told him to get down there. The house was still a disaster, and his workers were nowhere to be found. When Chuck arrived, they found me passed out in the living room under a pile of garbage. They had called the paramedics, fearing I had broken my neck, and had then come to check me out. Paris says you're lucky to be alive, honestly, said Chuck. Philip elbowed him, wanting him to shut up. Why? I asked. He said the whole place was crawling with black mold. It was around the crown of the ceiling, the baseboards. Hell, the whole place was at up. It's a good thing your brother left early, eh? I told Chuck I didn't remember him leaving. I told him about the bedroom, the tunnel, the strange things I'd seen there. I don't think Chuck believed me, but they did go back to the house to look for him. They came to see me in the hospital later that night, told me they hadn't seen a hide nor hair of him. He wasn't at home. They'd called Dad, and his truck was still at Chuck's place. They didn't know where he was, but they were sure he would turn up. I didn't answer that. A week later, they let me go, and I went back to the house. It's still a mess. The guys Philip got to clean it aren't as diligent as my brother and I, but they're great at leaving doors unlocked. I stood before the bedroom door like I expected it to open on its own and suck me in. It didn't, and when I finally opened it, I found not a tunnel, but a cluttered bedroom on the other side. Just a bedroom. No tunnel. No monsters, just a regular old bedroom. It's been two weeks, and no one's seen my brother. He's lying dead in some weird trash tunnel with his head caved in. A part of me knows this, but a part of me also knows that there is no trash tunnel behind that door. I don't know what to do. Dad is getting worried. The police have no leads, and I can't find the tunnel. I killed him. It's my fault. But if I tell people the story... They're going to lock me up in Golden View, right along with Mr. Foskey. I went to visit him a few days ago. No one's monitoring who visits the residents at Golden View. When I asked him about the trash tunnel and the glowing mold, he just stared at me blankly. I begged him to tell me, screamed at him to help me find my brother. But whatever light was in Mr. Foskey when I was in his English class is gone now. Now he just sits in the day room and watches soap operas with the rest of them. I don't know what to do. How do I get my brother back? What will happen to whatever poor sap buys the house next when I open that door? Will they find their familiar bedroom? Or will they be the next victim? It happened when I was on my way home from the flea market across state lines. I sell things I make out of junk, mostly. The term is trash sculptures in the community I belong to, but I never liked that term. Some may call this junk, but to me, they're treasures. I make all kinds of things from stuff I find at the dump. People, vehicles, animals, whatever catches my eye. They sell pretty good, but not in my home state. I usually end up driving to Sadie's Flea Market, one of these huge, sprawling outdoor markets in Alabama, 
to sell my wares. The people there love them, and today was the first time in a while that I've come home with anything. I was loading the sitter into the back of my truck as the sun went down. I had made him out of rebar and old license plates. He was definitely unique looking. I had some lookers, but he was a little heavy for my usual crowd. The sitter was what you would call an end-of-the-day purchase, to be sure, and no one was buying him today. I sat him in the back of the truck and grinned as he sort of looked like he was just sitting there, just resting in the bed of the truck after a long day of being on display. With my passenger secured, I cleaned up my stall and rolled out of the parking lot just as it was starting to get dark. The road was busy, but not overly so. It's about an hour to my house through some pretty rural countryside. I never minded. It's a pretty soothing view as you roll along towards the Florida-Alabama line. Most of the route is roadside stands, abandoned buildings, gas stations, and the ever-popular fireworks stand. It's hard to explain, but it always seems so desolate out here. A single pole light shining beside the shell of an abandoned house. An old store that's slowly being retaken by the woods. A rotting cooler that someone had left by the roadside. Its mouth wide open, its inside scummy. These were little things that reminded me that humanity had once had hope for these places and that are out of the way. And it made me wish I had the skill to use a camera properly. Some artistic type would probably have paid a mint for pictures of some of these things. As I drove, I saw other people getting ready to leave. The sun was setting, and it washed them out in a way that's hard to explain. It's strange, but the setting sun always seems to gray these people a little, making them look like actors in an early 90s show. The sunset seems to bleed all the color out of them, and it's kind of nostalgic for me. It always seemed comfortable. At least, it did until today. As I drove for the state line, the sun turned the trees into a fiery corona. A forest fire that burned on and on until it was snuffed out with the eventual setting of the sun. It started rather subtly. I had chalked it up to the sun, having gone down when I first noticed it. But as I drove past a familiar barn, I had to double take. The barn was old, older than me probably, but it looked like something drawn in a sketchbook. It's, it's hard to put into words, but it just looked flat and unfinished. As I watched... The light on the barn threw only a small circle of illumination, and the yard itself looked grainy and unreal. I watched as a cat scrambled across the yard, and he looked like he might be made out of graphite, like graphite lines that had learned to walk and move all on their own. I rubbed at my eyes as I rolled along, pretty sure I was just getting tired. I had been making sculptures and putting together today's pieces all week, and I was probably just starting to feel the strain. A little sleep was all I needed, and once I got home, I could start burning my candle at both ends again tomorrow. The sitter would sit in my truck till I woke up tomorrow morning, and I'd have added another piece or two by next Saturday. I didn't think much of it as I rolled along, until I saw the houses. The farther I drove, the harder it was to just ignore the strange changes in the landscape. I drove past a trailer park, and I could see all the gray lead outlines as the windows glowed. The insides looked like they were lit by bug zappers, that harsh fluorescent light making them seem to crackle. The spotlights made the concrete look porous, almost holy, and the dog resting out in front looked like if he were to bark, it would come out as a word bubble. It was, it was all so very unreal, and I had to look down at my own hands in order to discover whether I too looked like a pencil sketch. I was pleased to find my normal level of realness, and just kept driving as I tried to get past whatever I had driven into. It didn't get bad until I came to the stoplight, though. There was only one stoplight before you got to the state line. It's probably there to allow people leaving the gas station or the liquor store to get back on the highway so they don't get creamed. The gas station had only a single light over the pump, but the inside looked welcoming. It reminded me of that painting, the one of the dead celebrities in the diner, and I was half tempted to turn in when something whooshed up to my left, and I turned to see a fire going on the side of the liquor store. It wasn't much more than a one-room building that sold beer and wine. I had driven past that pink stucco building a thousand times, but it had an evil look to it tonight. It didn't glow like the trailers or the gas station did, 
and its face was dark and brooding as the glass reflected the fire on the side of it. At that moment, it seemed the antithesis of the gas station, and sitting across the street from each other, they almost seemed adversarial. The cars in the parking lot were the old rusty sort, pickups and dark-colored Cadillacs and long cigar-shaped constructions. They seemed to hunch around the lot like gargoyles, but as the fire began to build, I noticed the strange people that were feeding it. The store had a cage beside it, something the employees filled with cardboard boxes and trash and then burned when it got full. As I watched, the human-shaped creatures that seemed to be made of squiggly darkness were throwing boxes onto the fire and watching as they burned. The people weren't even approximations of people. They looked like a child's idea of human shapes, the bodies bulbous and the heads lumpy. Their arms were muscled and their legs disproportionately squat. They looked like orcs in the Lord of the Rings books, and just looking at them made me a little uneasy. They were supposed to be humans, but I had never seen anything less human in my life. They looked like natives in an old jungle picture, dancing around a flaming idol, and as I watched, I saw one of them take notice of me. I glanced back at the light, but it was hard to tell what color it was. All three were shades of gray, and as they flipped through, I couldn't tell what I was supposed to do. Something moved in front of that grainy flame then, drawing my attention back to the liquor store. The four of them froze as they saw that I had noticed them, their red eyes glaring as they prepared to run at my truck. Red or green, I no longer cared. I put my foot on the gas and blew through the intersection, rolling up the road as the four lumpy homunculuses watched me go. My tires squealed as they flew up the blacktop. The trees and the buildings we passed had begun to pulsate a little, their lead edges crackling like lightning. The whole thing looked like a Tex Avery cartoon, something from a sketchbook nightmare skit from an old show, and the longer I watched the sky, the less I cared about the road. My eyes were glued to that fuzzy space, the graphite lining sending phosphorescent clarity through the steely gray sky. Something was rising up amongst the clouds a silver orb of a moon that suddenly and unexpectedly filled me with fear. Then it rolled in the sky, and I was suddenly looking at the eye of some great beast. It swam in that inky space, this perfect orb, and when it found me, I began to shake. The eye looked straight at me, fixing me with its gaze, not blinking as it regarded me, and that regard bore into me. I found myself unable to look away. When the harsh lights and the equally harsh horn invaded my space, I continued to be aware of nothing but that huge blinking moon. Then, suddenly, everything went black and I was left floating in the inky blackness until the beeping brought me back to the waking world. I was in a hospital, arm aching from the IV and head pounding from the wound that had likely landed me there. My sister had been playing on her phone, but she looked up when I started groaning back to consciousness. She stopped me from getting up, and I realized that I only saw her out of the corner of one eye. Thankfully, the other was just covered in bandages, but at the time, it was pretty jarring. My sister filled me in and said she was glad I had come out because no one understood what had happened. According to the man in the moving truck, the one I had scared half to death, I had crossed into his lane as he was driving from the depot. He had swerved, barely avoiding the truck, and he said when I left the road something had fallen out of the back and he had thought my passenger might have slid out. I had proceeded into the nearby woods before the tree had stopped my progress. It wasn't until he went to check on my passenger that he realized it was nothing but a dented metal doll and went to check on me. He had helped me out of the truck and stayed with me till the ambulance came and that was how I had ended up spending the next four days in a coma. I don't know what happened and I can't really explain it, but somehow I slipped into something very different. The road I'd come to know was not what I had driven that night, and I suddenly found myself in a place that I couldn't come to terms with. I tried to tell people that, but they seemed to believe that I might have been drugged, or maybe I had picked up something I couldn't handle at the flea market. They never found anything heavier than Xanax in my system, though. My sister had floated the idea that I fell asleep and had a dream before I drove off the road, but... I know what I saw. I saw those things, and I'm lucky to have escaped. So if you're driving the highways of America, 
Be on the lookout for pockets of strangeness, and good luck to you if you happen to slip into one of them. When Jameson March, owner of March Mortuaries, put a sign out front of his business saying that he'd be selling honey, people thought he must be joking. What kind of mortician would sell honey? Would he sell it next to the caskets in his showroom? Would he offer it graveside at cemeteries? No one knew. But there was much speculation about that little sign. Those who asked Jameson were in for quite a treat. Jameson told them that he would be selling his honey right here at the mortuary, and even gave them a sample so they might tell their friends. What they sampled was supposedly the best honey any of them had ever eaten. They went on and on about the texture and the taste and the strange exotic flavor within the honey. They said how they couldn't wait for Jameson to sell honey, and they'd be buying as much as they could on opening day. Others began to question where he was keeping his bees. They saw no beehives on his property, a two-bedroom apartment above the mortuary. They saw no hives on the mortuary property at all, in fact. They saw no hives in the cemetery or near the crematorium. But still, the honey came. On the 3rd of March, the first jar of that miraculous concoction appeared in the front room of Jameson Mortuary. The mortuary was crowded for the next several days, and by Friday, not a jar was left to be purchased. Again, people praised the texture and the taste of his honey, as well as the myriad flavors that one would find within the jar. One of the buyers, Bert Lancaster, owned a large honey operation of his own. It is said that when he tasted Jameson's honey, he proclaimed that no bee in his field had ever produced anything so sweet. Some would tell you that he burned his beehives that very afternoon, but that's little more than town gossip. For that summer back in 86, no one could get enough of Jameson's honey. They say Helen Price used that honey to defeat her rival Linda Moore, in that summer's 4th of July bake-off. They say Bert Cavill put that honey in his mead and could not make enough of it to satiate the local drunks. They say Mary Sanders was taken to the hospital over in Oakley when she ate ten jars in a day and was reaching for an eleventh when her stomach ruptured. But again, that's all town gossip. What is fact was the discovery made by Randall Smith, a local tabloid writer, in the fall of 86. Randall had a reputation for being less of a journalist and more of a mudslinger. If there was a nasty rumor started, Randall could usually be traced back to it. He'd grown pretty tired of hearing about Jameson and his amazing honey. Randall was of the opinion that if something was too good to be true, than it likely was. He thought Jameson's honey must have some sort of secret ingredient that got people addicted to it. Maybe it was even a cover for some kind of dope operation that Jameson was running out of the mortuary or the cemetery. Whatever the case, Randall could smell a story, and it would be sweeter than any nectar the old mortician could produce. So one night, as the moon hung full over Pleasant Rock Cemetery, Randall and his friends, Rooster Malloy and Charles Drainer, took a trip out to the cemetery to have a look around. Someone had reported earlier that week that they had seen some larger-than-normal bees around the cemetery grounds, and speculated that these may be the source of Jameson's honey. As it was the only lead that Randall had, it seemed. It seemed as good as any. So after a couple of drinks at the Legion Hall, the three men piled into Rooster's old Chevy and headed down to do some late night snooping. Randall still tells anyone who will listen how the graveyard was as silent as its namesake. The gate was locked, sporting a brand new Academy security lock one of the big thick gold ones that graced the sheds and fences of 
discerning security buffs in town. So the three men had to find a different way in. This was strange, since the cemetery had never been locked before. Jameson had always let people come and go as they please. But just recently, the old man had gotten a little cagey about many things. For one, the cemetery was now locked at nightfall. For another, no one was allowed in the basement of the mortuary, not even the man who came to deliver the bodies for the families. For third, no one but his two sons were allowed to work in the mortuary anymore, and both of them were under pain of death should they reveal the secrets of Jameson's honey. The three men had walked around the fence before they found a spot where the last windstorm had knocked down a thick old pine. It lay on the points around the top, creating a rude bridge over the wall. Now, none of them being particularly spry, they had all of them carefully shimmied up the fallen tree and then dropped down into the cemetery, careful not to get stuck on them spikes. They all felt a chill as they stood in the quiet boneyard and Randall claimed that Rooster looked ready to brave the spikes if it meant being out of there. The wind rattled the skeletal trees on the grounds, and the little flags that had been stuck on some of the graves for Labor Day snapped mischievously and startled them more than once. They had brought flashlights, but the big old trader's moon that looked down on them was more than enough to keep them from tripping into a open grave or smashing their shins on an ill-placed tombstone. The quiet cemetery was enough to sober even the bravest of them, and it was probably why they heard the shovels before they saw the men. Crouching behind a particularly large family headstone, Randall saw two men digging into a fresh grave. They were exhuming a body by the light of that pregnant moon, and Randall knew whose it was to boot. We had been to the widow Hadley's funeral that day, and it appeared that whoever these men were, they were taking her from her freshly dug resting place. As they watched, the corpse flopped to the surface most unceremoniously, followed by March's sons, Hannibal and Gavin. Hannibal hefted the body, leaving his younger brother to fill in the hole as he took it deeper into the cemetery. Gavin went to his work, and bent as he was, he didn't notice the three men as they snuck around him and followed his older brother. Hannibal had been a football player, a linebacker for the local school team in his day, and he toted the frail old woman as easily as someone might a sack of corn. As they followed him, the three men weren't sure what they expected to find, but Randall was certain it would be something to add a macabre twinge to the story that he meant to write. They followed Hannibal as he came to a newly built mausoleum, the name across the door reading March. He unlocked the door and unceremoniously tossed the old woman into the crypt. The men hunkered low behind a pair of gravestones, but they needn't have bothered. Hannibal was a big boy, but his night eyes left something to be desired. He no more saw them than he did the place marker that he nearly tripped over on the way back to his brother, and as he stomped off into the cemetery, the three men approached the crypt. The mortuary was a nice new one, sunk into the ground a little, to protect any caskets placed down there, and it would have looked more at home in New Orleans than this Georgia backwater town. To the knowledge of anyone in town, the Marches did not have a family crypt until very recently. The only March buried there would be Jameson's wife, since his mother and father were buried up in Macon at their own family plot. Hannibal may not have been the smartest march in town, but it appeared he was smart enough to lock up behind himself. Another one of those big, thick academy locks, the kind that had been on the front gate, 
greeted the three men as they got to the door, and they were forced to prowl around the mausoleum to see what could be found. It was Charles who found the little vent in the mausoleum, but it was Randall who saw the whores that lay inside. Randall and Rooster had been looking for a window, or perhaps another entrance, when Charles came hoofing it back to show them that he had found a little vent that opened into the crypt. Randall asked him to show him where it was, and the three men found the little opening, just big enough for a large child to fit inside. Charles and Rooster now were pulp wooders and much too big to squeeze into holes. Randall, however, had made a career of squeezing into places he was not precisely wanted, opting to stick his head in to get a better look. Randall had his friends hold his legs while he shimmied into the vent. Charles and Rooster slid him in as far as they dared, and they said his flashlight could be seen through the slats at the top of the mausoleum. When Randall started screaming and yelling for them to pull him out, it sounded like the devil himself had gotten hold of him. When they pulled him out, they said he was white as a sheet and said to tell the sheriff immediately. Whether the brothers had gone when they made their escape or not, they missed them entirely as they beat a retreat back to town. Now the sheriff took some convincing to get out of bed, but when Randall told him what they had seen down the crypt, he came with three other men and the biggest set of bolt cutters they could find at the station. Jameson's sons were leaving when the sheriff and his boys pulled up, so they didn't end up needing the bolt cutters after all. When he laid it out to the two young men that they could either cooperate or sit in the same prison cell with their father, the one he was surely to occupy, they decided it might be in their best interest to show him what they was doing. When the sheriff asked the boys if they would need suits, the two shook their heads. Bees are mostly docile, Hannibal told them, and sure enough, when they cracked the door open, not a one came charging out. They descended into the ground, and by the light of the sheriff's flashlight, they saw the whores below. The bees swarmed the small pile of corpses, taking whatever they used to make the honey back to their hives. The hives covered the walls of the crypt, making a sticky webwork of catacombs. The corpses down below were fresh, most of them having died very recently, and the bees were taken to them with gusto. The brothers said they came down here once or twice a week to harvest the honey, and that the vulture bees were taken to the warm Georgia summer quite nicely. When the sheriff interrogated them, both said that it had been their father's idea. He had read about vulture bees and thought they sounded like an interesting idea. Then, when their mother died, he'd done a little experiment. He'd put her down in the mortuary and procured some vulture bees of his own. The boys had been horrified when he'd showed them what he'd been up to, but even they had to admit the honey had been the sweetest they had ever eaten. Something about the readily available nature of the local pollen mixed with the bees' instincts to collect whatever they got from the corpses, had made for a potent and delicious treat. She was the catalyst for all this, Hannibal had said. Those first few jars he handed out to the people for tasting were honey made from our mother's body. He began to cry then, but the sheriff had all the evidence he needed to proceed. He arrested Jameson March that very night, but there seemed to be some confusion on what to charge him with. Couldn't really get him for murder because he hadn't killed anybody. Couldn't really get him for fraud because he buried them bodies just like he said he would. In the end, they got him on simple corpse desecration and a little misdemeanor fraud for not telling the families what he intended to do with them their bodies. He got less than five years in prison. I hear the warden let him keep the beehives in the prison garden. Seems like his talents didn't go to waste 
not even behind bars. He left town when his time was served, he and his boys. The funeral home's been empty ever since. The police found the beginnings of his beekeeping operation in the basement. That, and a secondary hive, with a swarm of agitated vulture bees. Jameson tried to sell the mortuary, but nobody seemed to want a place with that sort of reputation. It collapsed under a late February snow back in 2012, and they destroyed the mausoleum they found all them bodies in about a year after Jameson went to prison. And that's the sordid tale of Jameson March and his bees. I have no idea what they did with those bees after they turned them out of the March mausoleum. They likely just turned them loose into an environment that was alien to them. So, if you should be traveling through the Georgia back roads and see some larger than average bees or taste sweeter than average honey, be very suspicious about its origin. I've been an artist for a few years now. I went to school with people whose understanding of art stopped at watercolors and still lifes, but those never really were my thing. I like to be experimental in my work, really push the boundaries of art. My high school art teacher, Mr. Caff, never really understood that, but it's probably hard to understand much of anything with your head firmly crammed up your backside. He was one of those types who thought the Renaissance was the birth and death of the artistic expression and that digital art was tantamount to blasphemy. He did not tolerate modern art in his classroom, and I likely wouldn't still be doing art if it wasn't for Terry. Terry and I met in art class freshman year, and we've been friends ever since. Terry is your textbook manic pixie dream girl, and her artistic medium is pop art with a soft spot for comics. She did all those reimaginings of classic comic covers, always in heavy oils and deep, saturated colors, and her work is really something to behold. Mr. Calf may not have understood her medium, but he understood her process, so she made straight B's in his class. I have a theory that he was trying to get into her ripped blue jeans, but manic pixie dream girls rarely fall for the middle-aged high school teacher, so tough break, teach. The old bastard tried to fail me, on the other hand, but I rose above it, and now I'm one of the most well-known modern artists in the city, likely to his chagrin. My art is far from what you'd consider classical. I make sculptures from various mediums, do charcoal prints, weird displays of paints and acrylics, and recently I've begun doing metalwork sculptures in something I'm calling transitory mundane. The basic premise is that you take something normal, a refrigerator or a couch or a TV, and make it utterly mind-blowing. My horror fridge took first place at last year's fall gala, and my TV apocalypse made the paper earlier this year. This time, however, I've got something really interesting in mind. Terry raised an eyebrow as I pulled the cover off my latest art project. I call it the Infinity Table. Terry looked dubiously at the rectangular living room table, a thick piece of glass sitting propped over a dark opening. It just looks like a regular table to me. I'm not sure what kind of concept you're going for, but I don't get it. I grinned as I leaned down, flicking a switch as the inside lit up to reveal the trick. Through mirror placement and strategic lighting, the inside of the table resembles nothing so much as a black pit that proceeds downward into infinity. A ladder was installed on the side and seemed to descend down into the pit. The mirror magnified it on and on and into the void. Terry's jaw dropped open as she ooed appreciatively over the illusion. The rocks on the walls and the crystal lighting, a really nice touch if I do say so myself. That is so cool! It's so simple yet intriguing. Everyone's going to want one after the show next week. But only one of them will get it. I think this may be my greatest art piece yet. The two of us cackled over my brilliance, and Terry told me about the panel series she planned to do for her own entry. Terry had been hard at work on an original comic series, so tired of bringing others' works to life and not getting to work on her own stuff. She was debuting a series of oil paintings from her own personal collection, and she hoped they would drum up some interest for upcoming series. I was listening, really I was, but my eyes kept being drawn back down to that yawning chasm that lay in the center of the table. It was an illusion. I knew it was an illusion. I had made it after all. But I couldn't keep myself from feeling the sightless black eye as it stared at me. It had discomforted me before, the way a scary movie makes you shiver even after it's over. 
but I always managed to shrug it off. I had created the illusion. I knew it wasn't real, but I could still swear that something lurked within it. I knew it didn't, but it still intrigued me. I was like a bird that knows the bag will trap him, but still wants to know what lies inside. Like a man who knows that the void stares back, but goes right on staring. Hello? Are you even listening to me? I shook myself back and apologized for spacing out. I flipped the light out on the table, and it was once again reduced to a black crater. Even turned off, I still felt like I could feel that inky mass looking at me, and I didn't like the crawling, scrabbling way it seemed to contemplate me. It had never looked at me like this during its creation, and it seemed to have gained a life of its own with its completion. It's cool and all, but I'm kind of glad you turned it off. I looked up as Terry shuddered, and the discomfort was an alien concept on her normally whimsical face. It, it scares me a little bit. I smiled, but I knew all too well what she meant. That's why Terry was my best friend. It was sometimes like we shared a brain. How did you even come up with something like this, she asked, still sounding equal parts terrified and amazed. I started to rattle off something about pure talent or the muse at work, but I honestly couldn't remember how I had thought of it. Had it been in a dream? It seemed like I had been inspired by something to build this piece, but I couldn't remember what. I had been so driven the last few weeks to finish it that I never really stopped to think why. Hello, you spacing out on me again? Terry laughed, snapping her fingers in front of my face. I shook my head, getting a grip before answering. Just the muse at work, I guess. I took her out for drinks then, wanting to forget about the feeling that dark eye had given me as much as she did, but it was never far from my mind. When I stumbled back that night, the few drinks turning into a few too many drinks, I stood over the table and looked down into the dark, unlit eye. Even drunk, I felt the regard of that hateful space, and it sobered me a little. I could feel it staring at me through the flimsy haze that lay between us, and the dark hole seemed to long for its freedom again. I reached for the switch with a shaky hand, the mechanism snapping crisply as it came to life. The light came on, but it was cold comfort. The hole stretched into the earth, a dark and gaping maw that filled me with dread. Why had I created this thing? How did it occur to me to make such a hateful portal? Had I... How had I conceptualized this? The longer I looked into it, the more certain I became that I could see something at the bottom. It seemed to move within the dark eye, with frantic, herky-jerky movements. It moved like something in a claymation cartoon, and its regard was like wasps crawling on my skin. I didn't know what it was, couldn't even tell you how big it was, but as my hands tremored back towards the switch, I saw one thing for sure. It had begun to climb the ladder. The light snapped off with a smart pop, and I was left once more with only the dark haze across the glass. I went to bed, but my dreams were plagued by that bottomless eye and that thing that moved within. I didn't turn it on again until the day of the show. I honestly debated just pushing it into an alley behind my apartment and forgetting it ever existed, but I had too much time and money invested in the project to just walk away. The components hadn't come without a cost, and the prize money, not to mention the money I would make once it was sold, would allow me to do art for another few months. If it flopped at the show, I might have to actually find a job, and that would be the biggest blow to the art community imaginable. So I loaded it into the back of my ratty old pickup, the camper allowing it to ride in relative safety, and drove it to the gallery. I had secured it with a rope, not wanting it to tip over and break, despite my misgivings. I could tell myself that I kept checking the rear view the whole time just to make sure it wasn't getting damaged, but that was a lie. I wanted to make sure that nothing simply climbed out of it as I drove through the crowded streets of Seattle to what I hoped would be a feather in the cap of my career. My neighbor had helped me load the table. Beefy neighbors have to be good for something, right? And thankfully, there were burly men in black security shirts to help me unload it. They did most of the unloading and reloading onto the hand dolly too, which was good because it had taken everything I had to put my hands on it as we loaded it into the truck. It had sat like a revered monolith in my living room for the past week. After I had woken up that first morning to a hangover and the sunlight illuminating the pit under that all-too-thin pane of glass, I had covered it with a tarp. I hadn't touched it, hadn't said anything on it, 
hadn't even let my feet lean against it the whole week, and the thought of its surface against my skin made me feel crawly. I couldn't remember why I had been so excited about this thing, and only a feeling of deep revulsion filled me when I looked at it. If no one bought it, I had decided I would donate it to the gallery after the show. At least I could write that off on my taxes. Terry waved at me as she saw me coming in, and her little bird arms seemed ready to pop as she wrapped them around me. I see you didn't get rid of it, she said with a smile, though her voice sounded strained. Terry wouldn't say so, but she seemed to feel the same trepidation I felt around the piece. I figured that someone would buy it, and who knows, the judges might really like it. She showed me her prints, scenes of dramatic heroes poised for battle, and spiraling cityscapes that oozed adventure, and I made the appropriate noises over them. It was always impressive what she could do with oils and paints, but tonight she had really outdone herself. I gave her another hug, wishing her luck as I pushed my hateful table over to the area that had been designated for me. A passing pair of lost frat boys helped me get it off the dolly, and far too soon I was left alone with this blight upon the world. I didn't turn it on, I honestly didn't really want to look at it, and I just contented myself to stand there as people bustled by and set up their own pieces for the show. Twenty minutes later, my mind wandering, someone called my name, and I turned to find a stern-faced woman looking down at my piece. What is it? she asked, a ribbon on her shirt letting me know that, though she wasn't a judge, she was still very important. The ribbon let everyone know that she was a contributor, the color putting her in a high tier. It's called an infinity table, I told her, her scowl not impressed. I reached down, my fingers trembling, and flipped the switch. I expected to see an angry something looking back at me, the glass bearing long cracks where something had battered it from the other side. But instead, it was just the same dark eye as always. It regarded the two of us with an unfriendly familiarity, and the stern-looking woman looked impressed as she took it all in. Very interesting. Not my style, but very interesting. You should leave it on if you want anyone to buy it. The endless tunnel is a definite selling point. I waited for her to move away before switching it off again. She had a point. If I wanted to get rid of this hateful thing, I needed people to see what it could do. The fear of something climbing out of it seemed silly now as all these people stood around me, but it was a silly feeling that wouldn't abate. In the end, my greed overrode my fear, and I flipped it on so I could draw in some interest. Interest, I found. People came over to have a look, and there was a fair amount of ooing and aahing. They asked how I had done it, wanted one of their own, but I told them it was a one-of-a-kind piece and would likely carry a steep price tag. All the while, my eyes kept flitting back to the crevice in the center of the table, as though I expected to see something crawl up from the depths. I could see, or at least I imagined I could see, the stunted figure as he stalked about at the bottom of the pit. It was trapped there. This was its prison and now I had given it a means of escape. I had invited it out of the pit, and now it could come into our world, and... Wow, how did you ever come up with something so cool? I started. Someone new had come up to ask about the infinity table, and I told them again about the concept. It all sounded so false to me now. I hadn't come up with the concept, though I could certainly talk about it in an educated manner. What a smart little bird I was. I could talk oh so prettily about my new project, using all the right buzzwords and trendy lingo to catch all these yuppies' attention. I was an artist. I created art. But I was beginning to feel like something else. This was beginning to feel like I was being used. Despite these misgivings, the show was going pretty well. People loved the Infinity Table. They thought it was really cool and a great perspective piece. I had a few tentative offers, but nothing serious. I would have probably taken the first offer, but the hole in the table kept distracting me. As I talked to people, I could see the small something beginning to climb the ladder again. It was still very small, like a fly crawling on a window pane. But as it climbed, it got larger and larger with each rung it grabbed. There was no way this could be real. I had built the thing. There was no hole in the void. It was all an optical illusion. Even so, the small creature was climbing up and up and up as these stupid airheads talked on and on about how much they loved my table. Hey! You okay? I jumped, realizing I'd been staring at the table for nearly five minutes. Terry was there, a well-dressed man grinning on her arm. Terry wasn't tall, but this guy looked like he might have had some hobbits in his family tree. He was short, hairy, dressed in a luxury white suit with a gold chain and a lot of very aggressive chest hair. I wasn't certain I could smell him, 
There were a lot of sweaty bodies, mine chief among them, but there was a definite tang of musky cologne and fragrant soap. Terry was smiling, but the smile looked paper thin as the man, whom I was already calling Leisure Suit Larry in my head, rubbed his arm against her hip. This is Clive, she said, indicating Larry as she slid herself free of him. He liked my art so much that he decided to buy all five pieces. I just knew he had to see your infinity table, so I brought him over here to have a look. Translation, Leisure Suit Larry was loaded Larry, and she was hoping she could solve both our problems. Larry had sized me up as she spoke, and I could feel my skin crawl under his less than altruistic stare. I consider myself a lover of art, amongst other things. Did you make this? he asked, looking down into the table as his eyes seemed to dazzle as they took in the sight of the gaping pit. I did, I began, but before I could say anything else, I looked down at the table and felt my throat constrict. He was bigger now, the size of a thumbprint, and climbing fast. He was speeding up, climbing rapidly, and I wasn't sure how the others couldn't see him. Did they not see the shadowy little creature as it grew from a thumbprint to the size of a silver dollar? Larry was saying something, complimenting my work, but all I could focus on was the growing spot of black as it climbed like a mad thing. I'm sold, love, he said to Terry, the word love making her flinch. I'll pay you 30000 for it. I, I couldn't speak. My throat was a stupid machine, incapable of doing anything but killing me slowly. The thing was twice as large now, growing quickly. I had no clue what I would do if it got to the glass and just started banging on that thin sheet of tempered material. Larry was looking right at it, his nose inches from the tabletop. How could he not see it? Playing hard to get, huh? Okay, 40,000 then. I could make out the top of its head, its face turned up to look at the land above. Its eyes were like twin coals its mouth open in a leering grin, and its hands were covered in hair or tar or something. Its body was like an undiluted shadow, a golem of darkness that was climbing like a fiend to get at the lighted world above. It seemed like I might have unintentionally created performance art, I thought with a weak little gasp. Escape from purgatory in real life. Terry slid her hand into mine and squeezed, bringing me out of my panic. What's wrong? She whispered, seeing my face and sensing my fear. You're a tease, aren't you? Larry said, looking up from the table coyly. Fine, but 50,000 is as high as I'll go, unless you agree to have drinks with me after the show. Then I might be willing to go up to 60. Sold, I squeaked out, afraid he would take it all back and leave me with this thing. He extended a hand over the table. As I shook it, I could see the creature's face coming closer and closer to the top, I pumped his arm twice before bending down to snap the light off. Can, can you take it now? I asked him, my voice sounding frantic even to my own ears. Don't you want the judges to see it? Terry asked, a little confused. The panel of three judges were just coming to the display area, but I didn't want this thing close to me for more than a second. The hell with the judges. The fear inside me was like a starving weasel, and I feared it would burst through my chest any minute. Can you? I asked again, looming over him. He nodded dumbly, taking out his checkbook and scrawling out a business check. I took it, and he pulled out his cell phone as he made some calls. He excused himself, and before Terry could ask any more questions, I pocketed the check and left the gallery. I met her later for drinks, and she said Larry had excused himself after the purchase. He said he wanted to get it loaded and set up in his own exhibition right away. I think you scared him with your intensity a little. We laughed about it then my soul lighter now that I didn't have to look at that hateful table anymore. I hadn't thought about that table until yesterday, about a week and a half after the gala. The check had been cashed, and the money had easily floated my art career for the next few years. I'd paid some bills, paid my outstanding credit card debt, and began living pretty comfortably off the excess. I was sitting on my couch, watching Netflix and eating a bowl of cereal for dinner, when my phone buzzed. It was Terry. She had sent me a news article along with a message telling me that I should watch it. Your art piece just made the news in New York, she told me, and the lack of emojis and lols made me a little wary. I opened it up to find an article about a murder at the gallery of Clive Foreman. The proprietor, Mr. Foreman, had been found dead in his gallery in Soho Tuesday morning. He appeared to have been drowned, though 
No water could be found in his lungs or on the ground around him. Doctors say it's as though he simply drowned on the floor of his gallery and was left there. The next picture was of a very familiar table. It had been broken, and the glass lay gaping and jagged like an untreated wound. The article went on to say that the murderer had left a message on the wall in either tar or some kind of oil, and as I scrolled to the next picture, I felt the phone slip out of my numb hand. The message on the wall seemed to glower at me from the floor, and I drew my knees up to my chest as I tried to make myself stop hyperventilating. It read, Your muse is free. My prison 